have you ever been in a situation where you're in a conversation and you realize that the person you are chatting with is maybe not as engaged in said conversation as you are? Um, this, this happens in my relationship with my wife. If I start talking motorcycles or records, I get the, oh yeah, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, she loves me. I know she loves me, but the records and motorcycles, it's like, okay, that's cool. That's your thing. Or the worst, and this, this, this is one that I have to battle against, is this little thing has become the devil in most relationships. Um, this, this is the thing that you, you tune out because you're like in the middle of a conversation, you do this. Because something vibrated, something, something buzzed in your, in, your, uh, in your pocket. I love, there's a, I've seen a trend starting up in restaurants now where uh, all of the cell phones, some, some restaurants even have like a basket that they'll put in the middle of the table where like all the cell phones go into the basket and the first person to check their phone picks up the bill. I really like that idea. Yep, yep. <laughs> all of you who don't have cell phones are like, yes. <laughs> like, free meals. Uh, have you ever been in a situation though where like the person just kind of seems to be like maybe a little bit tuned out, not entirely hearing what you're saying or just, you know, kind of nodding? Uh, there's, a, there's a story told of uh, Franklin Roosevelt, the president, who often had to stand in like long receiving lines. And, and you can imagine being in one of those situations where it's just kind of like guest after guest. And, and there's not a real intimate interaction that happens there. In fact, like those guests have been coached as to what they're allowed to say and what they're not allowed to say, right? Like if you get an opportunity to meet the queen, you're going to have, they're going to coach you. They're going to say, this is what you're allowed to say to the queen. This is, you don't start talking about a Brexit or anything like that. If you're, you know, you, you don't just break into some political discussion with the queen, right? It's just like, it's, it's such an honor to meet you or whatever. But Franklin Roosevelt is standing in this long receiving line and he had he was wondering, he'd often complain about the fact that like these things take forever and there's no, nobody's paying attention to what he said. So one day during a reception, he tried a little experiment. To each person who passed down the line, he shook their hand and murmured, I murdered my grandmother this morning. <laughs> and the guests responded with phrases like, marvelous, keep up the good work. We're proud of you. God bless you, sir. And it wasn't until the end of the line when the greeting from the ambassador from Bolivia actually heard what the president had said. And he leaned in and he said, I'm sure she had it coming. <laughs> Are we really listening? Uh, have you been in those situations? This morning, we're wrapping up our series on Teach Us to pray. For the last three weeks, we've been echoing the request of the disciples. When they, when they heard Jesus pray and they saw something that was going on in his life, they, they wanted what he had. And scripture doesn't tell us what they saw, but they, they said to Jesus, would you teach us your way of prayer? There's something about your connection with your father. There's something about the, your prayer life that they wanted in theirs. And so in Luke 11, we read these words. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. I love the way the voice renders this same passage. It says, teacher, would you teach us your way of prayer? John taught his disciples his way of prayer, and we were hoping that you would do the same. Would you teach us your way of prayer? I personally have been inviting Jesus to, to teach me to pray over the last number of weeks. And, and leading up to this sermon series, it's kind of been something that I've, I've recognized in my own life that I wanted to experience some growth in my own spiritual life and to have my prayer life kind of maybe churned up a little bit. And I'm somebody who likes to have a little bit of liturgy in his life, who likes to have prayers that I read on a regular basis. I walk through um, the daily offices and in the morning I, I will go through like a bit of a, I, I, I pray the same prayer to to open my day and, and to end my time with Jesus. I, it's maybe because it's part of my childhood growing up that way. Um, I, I did get my hands on something I've been trying to get for a long time. I, I finally got my hands on what's called a prie dieu, which literally translated means pray God. Um, but these are often found in, in more liturgical settings. Uh, often, you, like it, Right now, if you go to Quebec, you could buy one of these for $20. The Catholic churches are, are empty and these are getting sold out. But this is, it's a prayer kneeler. It's, it's a space where every morning when I come into my office, it's right beside my desk where I remind myself to start in a different position than standing at my desk or sitting at a chair. And to, to begin my day in prayer, it's something that I knew I wanted to have kind of grow in my own life. And so I've been praying that prayer regularly. Jesus, teach me to pray. 
Teach me what it means to pray. What does it mean to have connection with you? What does it mean to have connection with the Spirit and with, with your Father? And I hope that you have a space or, or something that's maybe been stirred over the last couple of weeks that's made you want to grow in your understanding of prayer and in your own prayer life. And maybe it's a chair in your house or maybe it's beside your bed or, or maybe it's in the car on the way to work. You've just decided I'm going to keep the radio off and I'm going to connect. Don't close your eyes. You can still pray with your eyes open. But that you be asking Jesus to teach you to pray and that this, this echo, this of the disciples would be the cry of our hearts. And it would be not just for a you know, four-week sermon series, but it would be something that would, that would stir up in us, that our, that our hearts would long for the intimacy and the power and the peace that Jesus had when he was here on earth and the time that he spent with his father. The scripture shows us throughout uh, the gospels that Jesus regularly went away and prayed, that he got away from the crowds. He even got away from his disciples and regularly got off to pray. In Mark 1.35, it says, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Luke 5.16, Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Luke 6.12, one of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray, and he spent the night, the entire night, praying to God. And I've tried to glean from some of these examples that, that prayer would be something that's regular in my life, that it's, that it's early in the morning. It's not something that I just tack on to the end of my day. Um, it's something that happens throughout my day. Uh, but when I first get into the office that I, that I see this reminder, I have a physical reminder that I need to stop and pray to get on my knees and then to, to pray through some regular liturgy, to pray through some regular uh, opportunities to pray, but then to focus on what does the day hold and what does God have for me to, to say, give us today our daily bread. And then what does that look like? What does it look like for God to supply my need for that particular day? And now this has not been a long journey that I've been kind of stretching into this a little bit, but I've already seen some of the benefits. These, these last few weeks have been very challenging for me personally, and, and I'm not sure how I would have handled the situations. I'm not saying I handled them all perfectly, but I'm not sure how I would have handled them if I hadn't begun my day on my knees. If I hadn't started those morning in the pre mornings in the presence of my father. Like I said, I still feel like I've got a long ways to go, but I've been crying out, Jesus, teach me to pray. Teach us to pray. And I, I hope this sermon series isn't just a blip on your radar, that as you go through a spring, it's not just another message from a pastor encouraging us to pray or telling us that we're not doing enough already. It's not about adding something to your life or, well, you need to spend at least 10 minutes. It's not, it's not legalism. It's not, it's not about making sure that you're, you know, checking off the right box. It's about growing in your relationship with Jesus and having an experience each day of connection with the Almighty. That if Jesus is the center of your faith, then communication with him should be at the top of our minds and at the first place in our hearts, something that we're looking to grow in. So we know that prayer is so much more than just talking about God or talking to God. It's more than sending good thoughts into the atmosphere. It's not just positive energy that we hope will someday come back to us. Sometimes we think of prayers that way, like, oh, I'd really love to, I'd really love to be able to get those bills paid off, and then somehow miraculously the money is going to show up in our bank accounts. So oh, I'd, I'd really love to be able to go on that vacation, and all of a sudden the seat sale comes on, and you're just, wow, it's, it's an answer. We've put out good vibes into the world and they've come back to us. We realize that prayer is engaging in a conversation with our creator, with our redeemer, our savior, our Lord. It's having our hearts tuned into his passion, his will, his ways. It's about being molded and shaped by the potter of our souls that, that yes, we speak and we know that he listens, but then God speaks and we listen, that it's this conversation that flows back and forth between our divine creator and his creation. And the first step is that, that we have, to, we have to open our mouths and we have to speak. We have to utter the words, our Father who art in heaven. We have, to, we have to cry out to somebody that is bigger than us, that is beyond us. And it's not just sending out well, good vibes or positive stuff. We're, we're speaking to someone. And we declare his praises. We give thanks for all that he's already done. But the, but that's not where prayer ends. For some people, it is. For some people, this is, it's a monologue. It's, it's, a, it's a soliloquy. It's, a, it's just a, it's a, well, we talk and hopefully good things happen. Perhaps this is why many of us struggle to pray. We don't really see the benefit of just telling God stuff and then nothing ever seems to change. God's going to do what he wants anyways, right? 
It's his will, it's his plan. It doesn't matter what your will or your plan is. So what's the point in praying? We're not even sure if he's listening a lot of the time. There's a beautiful story in the life of Abraham in the book of Genesis that I stumbled across this week. And I know I've read it before, but in the context of hearing a God who listens when I pray, I read it with fresh eyes. If you have a Bible with you, come to that book of Genesis, the very first book. If you don't have a Bible, we do have some at the back there, some paperback versions on the ledge at the sound booth. You can go ahead and grab one or download version is the one that we use here. Uh, it's a free app on your mobile device, all sorts of translations and reading plans. I'm currently doing a, a reading plan on prayer. Um, and then we have an event every Sunday that kind of will walk you through everything that's happening here this morning. But we're going to start in Genesis chapter 18. God has decided that he is going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. That's where we are in the history of Israel. Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah were these cities that were known for their wickedness. They were known for their debauchery. There was, there was, it was, they were vile, vile cities. It's, it, it would be the sin city of, of, the, of Israel. And, and people had been crying out against this city that, this is pre-Israel actually, this, they were crying out against this city that was just so wicked and so vile, like how could God allow this to happen in the world? And, and those cries had reached the ears of God and he had seen the injustice and the perversion and he was set to wipe it off the map. And that's where we come into the story this morning and Abraham is speaking to God. Genesis 18, to 33 Judgment is about to be meted out on Sodom and Gomorrah. And the men turned away and went toward Sodom. But Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Then Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in that city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? Abraham's got some guts. I almost used a different word there. (laughs) To stand up to God and say like, hold on a second, are you gonna, are you really gonna wipe out an entire city when there might be righteous people there? You're gonna wipe out the righteous as well? Far be it from you to do such a thing. Far be it from you, he says, twice. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? And the Lord says, if I find 50 people, 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I'll spare the whole place for their sake. If, if there's 50 people there, I won't, I won't let judgment rain down. So Abraham speaks up again. He says, now that I've been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though I am nothing but dust and ashes, What if the number of the righteous is five less than 50? Will you destroy the whole city for a lack of five people? And God says, if I find 45 there, I will not destroy it. So once again, he spoke to him. What if only 40 are found? And Abraham's like whittling God down from 50 to 40. And God says, okay, for the sake of 40, I will not do it. And then he said, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak. What if only 30 could be found? He answered, I will not do it if I find 30. And Abraham says, now I've been so bold as to speak to the Lord. What if only 20 can be found there? And he said, for the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. Then he said, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak just once more. What if only 10? What if only 10 can be found there? And he answered, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. And when the Lord had finished speaking with Abraham, he left and Abraham returned home. Abraham had this full-on conversation, almost an argument with God, where God had said, I'm tired of the perversion and the injustice, and I've heard the cry of the innocent, and I'm going to just, I'm going to lay down the law, and I'm going to wipe out Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham speaks up, and he says, but what about the righteous who are living there? What about those people who are still being hope and light in the midst of these really dark places? Are you you really going to wipe them out too? He says, there's got to be at least 50. And then I don't know what's going through Abraham's mind because he's maybe like, oh man, 50's, that's a long shot that there's actually 50 righteous people there. Maybe I can get God down to 45, to 40, to 30. And he ends up getting him down to 10. Now, did God change his mind? We know the Lord doesn't change. We know God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the Alpha and the Omega. But did God change his mind because Abraham pleaded with him? 
Scripture seems to say that possibly he did. Possibly Abraham's conversation with God, whether you believe that he already knew that he was going to do it or not, it was this relationship between Abraham and God that led to a very different outcome of this conversation. We know that Sodom and Gomorrah still ended up facing judgment, but we also know that God heard the prayer of Abraham and responded to it. Not only did he hear, he listened, but then God spoke and Abraham listened. When we speak, we know that God listens. His ear is bent towards the breath of his beloved. When you begin to whisper, his heart bursts with joy. I think sometimes we get this picture of God as this majestic and holy and righteous God, which he is. He is the one who's seated on the throne, who is worthy of all the worship that we could bring him. And, and like Abraham, we should come to him with a little bit of trembling in our voice with like, I, I don't know if I can be as so bold as to speak to you for I am nothing but ashes and dust, but will you hear me out? God doesn't say you're right, you're ashes and dust and I don't have to listen to a word you say. He bends his ear towards Abraham and he says, okay, I, if I find 45, if I find 30, if, if I find 10, I won't wipe them out. God listens because he loves. It's his compassion. It's his passion for us that leads us or leads him to listen to us. He hears your cry. Even before it's on your lips, God knows for he longs to hear your voice. But for many, that's where prayer stops. It's not just that we talk to God and then nothing happens. God hears us. He listens but for many of us, that's where it ends. We talk, God listens. God takes care of things. We leave it at his feet. We trust that he's going to look after it. It's, well, we've, we've done our due diligence, and now God's going to do what God's going to do. And this sometimes makes God into a bit of a, almost like a cosmic waiter. Like we've put in our order, and it's been a half an hour since we ordered our McGee's burger. So where is it? Or we, we start thinking like, you know, we've, we've done what we're supposed to do. Now God better show up. We, we've made him into like a supersized Amazon Prime where it's like two days shipping. It, it's, it should be here tomorrow. I can't wait for the drones. Like when, when are they going to start arriving in our backyard hours after we ask for something? We're people who want everything done right now. We, are, we microwave everything in our lives, not just our pizza pops. It's, it's about having everything now. If you've got to wait for 30 seconds, we were sitting at a stoplight on the way here, Emily and I, and it's, it's no right turn on red. And on a Sunday morning, no right turn on red is ridiculous because there is nobody traveling on that road and there's six of us lined up and I'm like, oh, I wish this was like no right turn. And then like literally 10 seconds later, the light changed and I was like, right. So I really only had to wait 10 extra seconds, but... Well, we want everything to happen now. And so sometimes we struggle with prayer because prayer is something that you could pray for 10 days and nothing happens. You could pray for 10 years and it seems like nothing happens. That God's timing is not always our timing. That God's answer is not always what we're looking for. Have you ever waited on a package that you expected to be shipped right away and it doesn't show up and like day after day you're like checking the mailbox and checking the mailbox and... You know how frustrating that can be. And maybe that's one reason why we don't pray. Maybe that's one of the reasons why we don't engage in prayer as often as we do is because we, we never see the answers come as quickly as we hoped they would. We never see the answers show up, maybe even at all. What we thought was going to be our answer doesn't happen. I heard someone say once that God always answers prayer. It's just that sometimes his answer is yes, and sometimes his answer is no, and sometimes his answer is wait that he always answers prayer, but we're not always listening, or he answers in a way that we didn't really want to hear. He's constantly speaking. He's constantly answering prayer. But do we listen? Do we understand? So we know that God speaks, and we listen. We speak, God listens, but then God speaks, and we listen. Do we know the voice of our shepherd? Do we know how to listen in prayer. John 4, 30, or 4, verses 3 and 4 say, the gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he's brought all, out all of his own, he goes on ahead of them and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. It says the sheep listen to his voice and the sheep know his voice. 
Last week we talked about how God speaks through scripture, that God speaks through creation, through other, other people and the different circumstances we find ourselves in and wondering if we have tuned our ears in enough to hear. Do we pause long enough to listen to what God might be saying to us? Right now, though you don't realize it, there are literally thousands of messages floating around your head. You hear my voice maybe fairly clearly, but there are other frequencies going on in the room right now. You might not recognize this, but Power 97 is broadcasting right outside your ear right now. Uh, Hot 103 is in the room with us right now. I don't know if Ace Burpee is on, but right now, you, if you could tune in, you could hear Hot 103 because those radio frequencies are traveling around in this room. There's all sorts of messages going around, but we're not tuned into it. Like if, you, can you hear Hot 103 right now? I can't hear Hot 103 right now. If you do, you might be a robot. Um, but if you had a radio dial, if you had a radio and you could tune it to 103, you would pick up that frequency that is in this room. And you would hear the music that's coming through or the talk that's on the radio right now. And you'd hear it loud and clear if you could tune in to that frequency. God's voice is very similar to that radio frequency. God is speaking constantly to us. God is engaged in relationship with his creation. And he wants to speak life and truth and hope. He wants to direct you. He wants to give you wisdom. He wants to lead you in ways everlasting. But sometimes we're not tuned in. We are not on the right frequency. We've got it. La, 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 I can't hear you. Or we've, we've either just decided that God's, God seems far away. That God's not really talking to us. But we haven't tuned into the frequency. Well, what is the frequency? What is the frequency that we need to turn into? Kenneth, what's the frequency, Kenneth? How do you know, how do you know that you're tuned in? How do you know that you're hearing the shepherd's voice? How do you know that, that that thought that comes into your mind, that thing that gets dropped in your heart, that that's God? How do you know that that's him speaking? Well, the best way to tell if you're hearing right, if you're sensing the leading, if you're maybe tuned into that voice, is to test the message. What does the message say? Is the message something that brings life and hope and peace? Is the message something that builds up and seems to encourage? Is it a message that challenges and maybe pulls you in a different direction? Is it something that brings blessing to other people? Is it something that's going to maybe cost you something? to test it? Does it line up with what you already know about God? Does the message you hear go like, yeah, that sounds like something God might say or something God might ask me to do? The first place I go when I, when I get that sort of twinge in my heart or that thought in my mind is I, is I go to scripture and I'll ask God to continue to speak, continue to direct, continue to lead me. And, and I find that when God is asking me to do something or God is speaking to my heart, it's not just a one quick thought. There's usually something else that comes right after it that brings some sort of confirmation. And I don't know if that's because I'm a little thick headed and I need to hear it four or five times before I finally act on it. Or if that's just the grace of God for the way that he speaks to us, that it's like, I'm going to keep telling you until you hear it until you know it in the depths of your being. So I go to scripture. Does it line up? Does it make sense with what I already know about God? I talk to trusted friends and mentors. I talk to other people who've walked with Jesus longer than I have and say like, I'm sensing this. Is this, is this something God might be asking me to do? Does it seem good to them and to the Holy Spirit? Does it seem like it's something that's confirmed in your heart? And then finally, just try it. Step out. Uh, I had a friend who, um, after I became a Christian, she and her husband, they, they did this discipleship thing with me. It was pretty cool. I was just getting ready to graduate high school when I got saved, and, uh, and I was on the worship team with them. That's a bit of a longer story, but, but they invited me over on a Wednesday night. Every Wednesday night, I could go over to their place with this little booklet that we go through that had kind of a topic, and then I could ask any questions I had about faith or Jesus or, or life, and and so I did that for like six, six or seven weeks that we were just kind of discussing faith stuff. And in that time, she heard God say, I'm going to call Scott to ministry. And she was like, okay, like he, like, yeah, he got saved, but he's still really rough around the edges. Uh, 
Scott was a like big Metallica fan. Um, Scott wasn't the kind of guy that you would like put directly into a pulpit. That's for sure at 17 years old. But she heard God say, I'm going to call Scott into ministry. And so she continued to pray and she was just like, I don't know, like was, that was maybe just me getting overly excited about the fact that like, they, you know, God was doing some work in Scott and, and, and making some changes in his life. And so she kept her mouth shut. She didn't say anything to me. And it was multiple months later that I was, uh, I was in university. I was working on my political science degree. I was pretty sure I was going to become a journalist. I loved writing. I loved reading. And, and that's where I was headed in life. It was like, I'm going to go work as a foreign correspondent. I'm going to write incredible, life-changing articles in Maclean's. And people are going to just be wowed by my brilliance. And I made it through three political science classes before I was like, I don't think I want to go and do this. Um, and what I was doing is in between classes and sometimes skipping classes, I would sit with my Bible at the back of the theater and I was just reading scripture. And I was pouring over the Bible and just kind of eating it up as a new Christian and, and, and still having conversations with my friends back home. And then I was like, I need to go to Bible college. And so I was like, I went to Bible college for a year the next year. And even then she didn't, she didn't say anything. She's like, okay, he's going to Bible college. That's, I mean, that might be ministry. But I was only going for one year and I was doing some other stuff. And then I came home from that one year and I was like, I think I'm called to be a pastor. And her eyes welled up with tears. And she told me about her prayer and told me about that time where she, when I had just gotten saved, had heard God say, I'm going to call Scott into the ministry. Now, if she had told me then, I don't know if I would have heard it. I don't know if I would have got what God was doing in that moment. But when I got to the place where I'd heard God say, I want you to, I want you to give your life for, for me and I want you to serve me uh, through the ministry, she brought confirmation. She brought another word that, was, that brought just clarity to that call in my life. But it still required me to step out. It still required me to continue on in my journey. So if you hear something, it doesn't mean you have to go like, this is definitely a word from the Lord. It could be bad pizza. Um, Test it. Look at scripture. Does it make sense? Does it line up? God is telling me that I should sell everything and move to Africa. Yep, might be. Test it. Look at scripture. Talk to trusted friends. See if God continues to bring that message over and over again through different means and different ways. It, it's funny because I've never, I've been called a ministry, um, but I've never applied for a church. Officially, I've never I've never gone looking for a job. I've never gone looking to pastor a church. I started in Carmen. When I was in Carmen, I was approached about coming into Winnipeg to help out at Soul Sanctuary. And then we started the upper room, which was kind of my own thing. There, wasn't a, there was no board to apply to. And then here I, I, was, I was asked if I would consider applying. The, the, it's never been a me just going to make stuff happen. It's the, is the door open? Does this seem like it's God? Is this... Are you speaking? Because I want to follow your voice. I want to do what you've called me to do. We speak, God listens. Then God speaks and we listen. Now, listening, parents, you understand this. There's a difference between hearing and listening. There's a difference between hearing my voice and doing what I say. <laughs> Dishes need to be done. Yeah, once my game's finished. 20 minutes later, dishes still need to be done. You haven't really listened until you've taken some action. One of my favorite, sorry Luke, one of my favorite, <laughs> one of my favorite stories, it could have been Emily, um, one of my favorite stories from the life of Peter, the apostles, when Peter walks on water. I, I would have loved to have been in the boat when that, check that, I would love to have been Peter in that moment. I would have loved to know what it felt like to actually just shh, <laughs> and have solid ground underneath you as you step out into the storm. This is the story we find in Matthew 14, verses 22 to 33. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on the mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, when he was alone, the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. 
When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. And here's Peter. Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Is that the first thought that would roll through your mind if you saw your savior, your teacher, your rabbi walking on water? Would you be just like, hurry up and get in the boat? Like, <laughs> would your first thought be like, okay, if it's you, I wanna, I'm coming to do what you're doing. But that's what Peter does. And Jesus says, come, come, he said. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on water and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and he began to sink and he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshiped him, saying, truly, you are the son of God. Often people focus on the, the last part of the story. They focus on the fact that, that Peter got distracted by the waves and he started to doubt that what was happening was actually happening and he could walk on water. He started to sink because he saw the storm around him. And, and we focus on the phrase that Jesus says, oh, you have little faith, why did you doubt? And we sort of feel like Jesus is judging Peter for, for not you know, having a strong enough faith to be able to walk on water. But can we pause for a second and realize that he's the only other human being who walked on freaking water? right? Oh, you have little faith. Yeah, all the other disciples are back there cowering in the boat. Peter got out and walked on water because he heard Jesus say, don't be afraid. It's me. Okay, if it's you, I want to come to where you are. I want to walk out where you are. I want to do what you're doing. I don't care if Peter only made it 10 feet before he got distracted. He walked on water. He stepped over the edge of the boat. I don't imagine that was an easy decision to make. I wonder what it would have felt like to see waves all around you and to put your foot into one of them and not sink. To hear that voice say, come. And then to do something about it, to step out of the boat. When God speaks, do we listen? When God speaks, do we immediately go, okay, I want to go where you are. I want to do what you've asked me to do. I want to be about what you're about. When he says, come, do we step out of the boat? Do we say, yes, I'm going where you've called me? When we speak and God listens and then he speaks, do we go, I'm ready to go. I'll do what you ask me to do. But what if the waves are really high? Do you still hear him say, come? Do you step out of the boat? Will you walk towards it? What if the storm is raging? What if, it's, what if it's not the right time? What if I drown? Can you still hear his voice? Because he's right there with you. I love the detail that's added there in Matthew, where as soon as Peter cries out, he's distracted. Yes, he doubts. Yes, he starts to sink, and he says, Lord, save me. What word do you see right after that? Immediately. Immediately. I don't know how far away Jesus was when Peter started to sink, but immediately Jesus was right there and pulled him up out of the water. And I can imagine a smile on his face. Peter, you did it. You walked on water, but why did you doubt? Why, 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 what, did the storm really scare you that much? Did you, did you forget that it's me? I, I walked out here. I can calm this. Do you hear his voice and do you know that he's right there with you? Will you listen? Will you open your ears and open your heart? What is God speaking to you? Because God doesn't just speak through Sunday morning messages or inspirational quotes on Facebook. God speaks and he's constantly speaking. Is your heart open? What is God saying to you? And is your heart tuned into his voice? Have you dialed in the right frequency? And if you have trouble hearing, maybe you need to slow down a little bit. Maybe there's some stuff in your life that needs to go. Maybe there's some sin. Maybe there's some junk that it's like, you know what? If we, if we could get that out of the way, you'd maybe hear a little more clearly. Maybe you need to rid yourself of some clutter. 
to spend some time to find a place where you kneel and you pray and to practice hearing that voice of God, to read scripture, to fast, to get up early, to find silence, to maybe get out into nature, to unplug, to tune into a different frequency. Because if prayer is only us speaking good things out into the uh, atmosphere, it, it doesn't accomplish much. And if it's only that we speak and God listens, that's great, but where is the, where is the relationship in that? It's, it's us talking and him just having to listen to us drone on. But prayer is us speaking, God listening, but then God speaking and us saying, I'm ready to go. I will do what you ask me to do. Are you listening? What is God saying to you today? How is God speaking to you? And if he says, come, will you step out of the boat? Let's pray. I believe with all of my heart, God, that you are passionate about each individual life that is represented not only in this room right now, uh, but the kids who are upstairs, our neighbors across the road, our family members who are not able to be with us today. You are, you are passionate about each and every one of your creation. You love them with an everlasting love and your desire is for them. I believe with all of my heart that you, you speak to us, that you, you draw close to us, that you, you meet us in our time of need, that you bring those words of encouragement, that you, you lead us in your paths of righteousness for your name's sake. You, you lead us in the ways everlasting. But I also believe there's been times where I've missed your voice, where I have been either distracted by the storm around me or I have plugged up my ears and just said, I don't, I don't wanna go there. I don't, wanna, I don't wanna have to forgive that person. I don't, I don't wanna have to go down that path. I, I don't wanna serve them. I, I just, I, I wanna do my own thing. And I've missed your voice. But that hasn't stopped you from speaking. It hasn't stopped you from gently correcting my own heart and my own mind, drawing me to a place where I recognize that your ways are higher than mine and better, that your path is the path where I will find the greatest peace, the greatest joy, the greatest fulfillment as I walk in what you've called me to. So my prayer for each one of us who's here would be that we, we would be people who, who speak and know that you listen but then we would open our ears to hear what you would want to say to us, that we would recognize prayer as conversation, not a monologue, that, that you do want to speak to our hearts and that when we hear you, we would, we'd act on what we hear. We'd go back to scripture. We'd continue to flesh out what it looks like in our lives, but that we would be obedient to what you speak into our hearts, that if it means that we, we give up our time to serve somebody, if it means that we give more of our finances to invest uh, in something or in someone that's in need, that we would be open and obedient to those things. If it means that we, we do without so that others could have, if it means that we change careers, if it means that we move into a different neighborhood, Lord, that you would give us wisdom in, in walking out what you call us to do, but that we'd be a little bit like Peter where it's, we say, if this is you, then tell me to come. If it's you, I wanna go. And I'm going to go where you call me. And I'm going to say what you ask me to say. And I'm going to do what you ask me to do. That I am going to hear that still small voice. I'm going to listen and I'm going to act. So Lord, would you teach us to pray? Teach us to be people who walk out what we hear as your spirit leads us. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, that's it for this morning. We are going to be uh, heading downstairs. For those who are ushers and greeters, we're going to have a short meeting. We'll start at noon, and we're going to endeavor to wrap up by 1230. Um, so you can join us down there for some snacks and some, uh, and some fresh vision. And then uh, next week, we are going to be, Lord willing, we're going to be talking about There Goes My Hero. Um, next week. So join us next Sunday, invite your friends, and be praying for our coming summer uh, adventure week. Have a great week, guys.